All right, hello and welcome everyone to the National Academy of Inventors premier ScholarShare webinar series. My name is Jade Stewart and I am currently serving as the director of the National Academy of Inventors. For those who may not be familiar, the NAI is a member organization comprising US and international universities, government agencies, and nonprofit research institutes with over 4,000 individual inventor members, fellows, and senior members spanning more than 250 institutions worldwide. The NAI was founded in 2010 to recognize and encourage inventors with patents issued from the US Patent Trademark Office enhance the visibility of academic technology and innovation, encourage the disclosure of intellectual property, educate and mentor innovative students, and translate the inventions of its members to benefit society. We offer a variety of programs for our members and partners, including but not limited to our mentorship platform, the Global Academic Inventors Network, commonly referred to as GAIN, which connects students, researchers, and faculty from across the world. We also produce and publish in-house our multidisciplinary journal, Technology and Innovation. And recently, most recently, we launched From Campus to Commerce, a video series featuring early stage innovation that takes place at our member institutions, such as the inventors of plant-based protein alternative Beyond Meat from the University of Missouri. We also offer two recognition and award programs, fellows and senior members. We are still accepting nominations and encourage you to submit an application or nominate your peers for these awards. Our organization is committed to using its platform to help minimize barriers and promote an inclusive environment for all, especially through these programs I mentioned. Though we were not able to have our annual meeting this year, we are excited to present our virtual scholar series. Today's webinar titled, How Can University Incentive Systems Best Encourage Highly Engaged Fundamental Research for Addressing Society's Deepest Challenges? And I would like to introduce our moderator for this panel, Mark David L. Sadell, who is the RBC Financial Group Professor of Entrepreneurship, Director of the W. Maurice Young Center for Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Research, an associate professor of OBHR at the Sauter School of Business at the University of British Columbia. Mark, welcome. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I, my role here is very brief. It's just to actually get out of the way of the first three presenters uh, who will be all come from the High Bar Alliance that our first presenter will actually tell you a little bit more about. I just want to introduce you to them so you know who will actually be leading us through these discussions today. So if Lauren, you can just go to that next slide. Uh, the first that we have is, next slide, Lauren. <laughs> there we go, is Richard Berman, who you see there uh, on the screen, uh, smiling, because he just saw him his name with a tie that he's not wearing. Um, he's the Associate Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for Innovation and Research at the University of South Florida. He's also a visiting social entrepreneurship professor in the College of Business and a professor in the Institute for Advanced Discovery and Innovation. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of, uh, of the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. As a board member on multiple boards, including Seeds of Peace, the Savannah Center for Diplomacy, Democracy and Development, Catasys, and Emblem Health, among others, over his career. He was also the former special advisor to the leader of the African Union United Nations peacekeeping mission in Darfur, and the former president of Manhattanville College, who turned around Manhattanville College from all of the news. Uh, and also, most related to today's discussion, he's one of the members of the High Bar Research Alliance Council, the, the guiding council, which is a group that we're going to tell you a little bit more about today as well. So next slide, Lauren. Next is Jerry Davis, who is also pictured with a tie of, uh, there, uh, which is very rare for him, for those of you that know him. Uh, he's the Associate Dean for Business and Impact uh, at Michigan Ross School of Business, and also uh, the Professor of Business Administration at Michigan, as well as a Professor of Sociology. He's an Academy of Management elected fellow, a Society for Progress fellow, co-founder of the RRBM Responsible Research and Business and Management Network, along with several of the other people who are on the call today, as well as the co-founder of the Community of Social Innovation, COSI, and he's the former editor-in-chief of Administrative Science Quarterly, a leading journal in a variety of fields. 
and also importantly for today on the High Bar Research Alliance Collaborative Action Group uh, that's responsible for putting on this seminar today, which is the group that's focused on how to change incentive systems in, in the academy. Uh, and then the last slide, please, Lauren. The last is Lauren Whitehead at the University of British Columbia. He's the Special Advisor on Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Research here at UBC. He's a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UBC and also a professional engineer. Uh, he is on the Board of Administration of the International Commission of Illumination. He's the founder and project director of the Bayview Alliance, holder of more than 130 US patents that have generated seven UBC spin-off companies. And importantly for today, he's the Hybar Research Alliance founder and current director. And with that, I turn it over to Lauren to give you a little bit more of a background. Thank you all. And Lauren, you're muted. There we go. Well, Mark David, thank you very much for, um, for the kind introduction and your role in helping to organize the meeting today. Um, I, I've been asked to say some introductory remarks, um, and, and I'd like to begin by again thanking Jade and, and the NAI for hosting this event and actually proving a very uh, a cooperative and helpful partner for, for the High Bar Research Alliance. Um, but I've been asked to talk about High Bar Research itself, uh, and I will keep this very brief. You know, we could have an hour or a day on, on talking about High Bar Research. But we're here to hear from the people in the room, some of whom are associated with the high bar research and others who are new, and we'd like to welcome you. So I, I will be um, re relatively uh, brief today, but I, I will be answering the two questions. What is high bar research and what is the high bar research alliance? So here's the thing. Uh, universities, of course, solve many problems in society and want to do so, but they could do more. So we think there's a possibility of being more effective. And one of the things that kind of gets in the way is the fact that we mostly do work that is either applied or, or th more theoretical. So that is, you know, it's either fundamental or applied. The fundamental research is often somewhat disconnected from use. It's not a bad thing, um, but it is a factor that can get in the way of progress. And applied research is often too short term uh, and therefore may not have the greatest long term impact. So um, obviously when it's framed this way, you can think, well, why not combine the benefits of, of the two? And that's not a new idea, it's actually a time honored idea of doing research that is both basic and applied. And it has a, a more modern name now called highly integrative, basic and responsive research. So that's what we're here to talk about. And it actually has a very well uh, defined meaning and, and the meaning kind of matters. So let me just explain that to you. There, there are four ways that a research project uh, has to be viewed for it to be a high bar project. The first one is the motivations, the people that drive everything, uh, the people in the project have to really want to discover new knowledge and have to really want to solve problems. And those are not in conflict, but they're different. And they both need to be there in a high bar project. And similarly, of course, any research project requires um, excellence in traditional research. But also high bar projects build in excellence in uh, creative design approaches to solving problems. And uh, these aren't in conflict, but they can be highly um, uh, complementary. Very importantly, the people who make the projects happen uh, need to combine excellent researchers, of course, but also excellent uh, and, and external visionary partners who can bring a closer understanding of the problems of interest in, in a certain situation, and who frankly also may just be better at solving problems uh, than, than many traditional researchers are familiar with when it comes to critical matters. And then lastly, uh, very importantly, there's a time frame aspect to all of this. The big advances take time, almost always. Uh, and so there's a need to make the investment in that time but while do, doing so, there's a very important need to maintain this strong sense of urgency. So all of those um, criteria, those four dualities, as we call them in high bar research, are, um, are complementary, uh, but there's a little bit of tension between them. And when they're all present, great things happen. And quite a bit of work has been done uh, by, by many experts to identify this correlation between excellence and result and the combination of these features. And uh, just to maybe name a few breakthroughs that high bar research has given us over a very long period of time, penicillin, the transistor, the GPS system, the internet. Um, this could be a very long conversation, but it won't be. The fact is high bar 
could do some great things and we would like to do more of it. So to try to put that in perspective for the purpose of today's discussion, it's helpful to think of, of, high, of research projects in general as consisting of subtasks. So I'm not gonna get too fancy in this description, but you know, if you think projects are big, they take time, you know, they have grant applications to support them. But when you look at the work, there's a bunch of little things being done that collectively make the big thing happen. And those little things can, can be sort of identified on a continuum here between the theoretical end of the continuum, if you can see my, my cursor, and a practical end of that continuum. And just to give you an example, um, let's say an astronomer measuring the redshift of a galaxy somewhere in the universe. Well, that would be up sort of toward the top end of this particular spectrum. Let's say a researcher is measuring the strength of a new kind of concrete. Well, that would be more at, at the practical end. So there's a spectrum here. And the only uh, reason I'm making that kind of esoteric comment is to say it gives you a nice way of picturing high bar research. So if you look at basic research projects, and each of these vertical bars is an example of some project in basic research, the dots represent these tasks that I'm talking about, and they're kind of distributed. And in basic research, if you look at those tasks, they look a lot more like an astronomer measuring redshift than, uh, for example, uh, looking at the next example here, applied research, where that's where you might find somebody measuring the strength of a sample of concrete. So applied research projects drift toward or collect toward the, the lower end of this range. It's not, it's not a lesser end, it's just a, a different end. And basic research projects are up toward the theoretical end. And now I'm sure you know where the next slide is going. High bar research is kind of middle in every way, but in important ways. So high bar research projects contain tasks that span the entire gamut from practical to theoretical. And very importantly, they're centered in a kind of a middle zone here in this spectrum, where it's not really normal to find projects with that level of theoretical significance in applied work or vice versa with basic work. So it actually increases the amount of activity in this central zone uh, quite a bit. So, okay, that's the theoretical reason that high bar is, is productive. A lot's been written about it. Fact is it works, so how can we do more of it? So that's of the practical question for today. And that brings up the High Bar Research Alliance. Now, what is this thing? Probably the most important thing I can say about it is that it's a, a network of very, very uh, committed people. People that are working together in various ways, and I'll talk about those ways in a moment. Uh, but their goal, which I'll also describe in a moment, is to make more High Bar Research happen. So, so that's what it's about. But of course, people can't achieve much as a group unless they're organized in some way. So we're very lucky to have had um, organizational efforts for this activity provided by 12 um, uh, founding universities. So these are the 12 that are listed here, I won't name them. But what these universities have done through each of their vice president's research offices is provided a council, and uh, Richard, for example, is a, is a member of that council, um, a council that, that is collectively helping to organize this group of well-meaning people so that their work uh, actually ends up uh, producing something and it's coming along very well. So it is yes, it is an organizational effort um, But it's one that we're very grateful for but, but I just like to emphasize first of all I'll repeat the people of the high bar research alliance can come from anywhere not just from the university system They come from organizations of all kinds and from all universities So there's no inside track for people who are lucky enough to be working at one of these member universities. It's just a collection of people uh, with some help in the organization. So this collection of people has a goal, and the goal is this, to achieve within 10 years a system-wide fourfold increase in the fraction of university research projects that are high bar. But that's, but there's a little bit more. That, first of all, would have meaning of going from about one project in 20 today, which is the current estimate for the amount that's in, in the system right now, to about one in five. So it's a fourfold increase, but it still won't be the majority of research at universities, but it'll be a very healthy portion of that amount. Uh, and very importantly, this would be while strengthening all other important forms of research. So there are no losers in the enhancement of high bar research. It's just a question of how we can collectively um, help it to occur. And that gets us back to the topic for today. So we're, um, we're doing our work through four collaborative action groups, as was mentioned earlier. Um, the one that's most relevant today, as, as already mentioned, is the Academic Incentive Systems Group, 
And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But just so that you know, the other ones are um, a group working on facilitating high bar across disciplines. Uh, that's an important aspect of high bar work. Um, there's one uh, putting a lot of effort into the relationship of the high bar research alliance with the countless other organizations uh, in the research ecosystem uh, that we think are highly collaborative and we would like to work with. So that's well underway. Um, and generally, there's a need, of course, for the actual people of the research system to understand this. And it's not that they don't understand the principles, because these are standard research principles, but the idea of encouraging them. And that encouragement gets us actually back to the business of the academic incentive system. So I'm just going to quickly summarize our, our underlying uh, motivation for today, and then I will hand it over. Um, so here's the thing. If we as a system want more high bar research, then doing it is going to have to be attractive for faculty members, for researchers. That's sort of obvious. So therefore, high bar research should assist them with career advancement. And how can you expect somebody to want to do something if it's not going to be good for their career? It's, a, it's an understandable factor. And that's the problem. The problem is simply this. Pursuing high bar can yield fewer publications and citations at first. There's actually excellent evidence that in the long run, it's fantastic for careers. But in the short term, particularly at a point where somebody may be facing a promotion and tenure decision, it may be that according to classic metrics, they've suffered a little bit by virtue of high bar. So that is the issue. And our mission for today is this. We will have interactive discussions led by experts, and our participants will share and deepen their understanding of the assessment challenge and collectively identify some practical steps to help address it and consider how to apply them to encourage high bar research. So that is our goal for today, uh, and I've done with my presentation. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over to my uh, respected colleague, Richard Berman. Richard. And Richard, it looks like you have to unmute your microphone. We find if you hover over your uh, face, ah, great. So my piece really is, is very short, and it's to indicate the, the strength of um, the focus on the outcome, the focus on uh, really working on the social problem focus of it. Um, and, uh, and to talk more about sort of the, the concept, I, I'm a visiting professor in a college of business on social entrepreneurship, but the real work on the discovery piece um, comes much more from a lot of the other basic sciences as, as well as social sciences and engineering. Um, and so I just wanted to put that little emphasis in and am I supposed to go to the breakout groups or is Jerry going to do that? That one's you. Huh? That one's me, right? So what we're gonna do is in the first part, uh, we're gonna break out into small enough groups where everyone can actively participate. So I think what you've seen to date is the last of us talking at you and much more trying to really understand the problem and to begin to get a better hold on the solution. And so as you can imagine, as, as Lauren and others set up, the question is about promotion and incentives for faculty members. And uh, we need to understand better what the questions are that people would be asking of a recipient or looking for in the package of a candidate up for tenure uh, so that we can begin to identify the barriers and then talk about later solutions to those barriers. So the first breakout group um, is going to really raise the question uh, of, you know, looking at a case example, what question would you be asking that portfolio or that individual uh, that might make you more comfortable about granting tenure or less comfortable about granting tenure? Um, and so we will lay out sort of the case example for you in the session. Um, and then what we need to 
basically understand is what three questions would you have that would trigger your decision to vote for or against tenure? Um, and uh, we are, I think, based on that, ready to go into the breakout groups. Yes, so you should see an option to join the breakout room. So if you can head there, that'd be great. Group number one. It's probably me. Group two. <laughs> uh, I was in group two and, and Colleen Parker um, I took the notes for us. Yep. So do you want me to run through the notes? Yes, please. Okay, so we uh, reviewed the three cases um, that were found in the documentation before the program uh, about the fundamental researcher, the high bar researcher, and then the applied uh, researcher. Um, and we discussed questions uh, to ask, and we came up with a number of questions. Um, and Lauren, correct me if I'm phrasing this. Uh, incorrectly, uh, but questions involved, um, are there partners involved? What kind of networks do that partners have? Are they closely connected to those using the results of the project? Uh, we also talked about what kind of network does the researcher have with the academic community? Is the network with lead scholars with proven track records? An important criteria might be the quality of the network uh, but we should also be sure to think about issues of diversity and inclusion. Are there immediate milestones that have been met? Duration of the project may be an issue. How do you determine progress? Who is an external expert that could assist with this case? Uh, the external commenter would be someone familiar with high bar research and familiar with the problem. Has a researcher carefully explained the science problem to be solved, articulating the problem and the project plan and vision? And has the researcher constructed a collaboration with different types of stakeholders interested in advancing this research? That's really good. Thank you so much, Colleen. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we'll go on to three and not take comments in between. Is that right, Lauren? Mark David said yes, so group number three. Uh, so actually, I was in group number three. We, we had a mixture across the fields of uh, the STEM, uh, several from physics and several from social science as well. Uh, one of the largest questions that came out without a specific measure for it, but what it was trying to get into the measurement was, was intellectual leadership, uh, which was still loosely defined in terms of what that means um, or how to measure it. And we, we went around several different things around how you might be able to measure intellectual leadership. Some of the markers that group number two uh, was talking about popped up as well. Uh, some of the clear ones that came out though were uh, aspects of, for certain fields of intellectual property that actually gets generated. Uh, so the actual intellectual property, the letters that come in particular were, were quite relevant for some and then funding, the types of funding that come in as well. There wasn't as much discussion about the networks as in group number two, uh, but there was some mention of collaborations to see who they were partnering with and what types of progress that would produce for later. There was a great concern raised about the risk generally of asking assistant professors generally to engage with this. Um, and as well across demographic diversity, depending on the individual um, family situations and all of that as well. Um, the one other aspect that came out was consistency. So um, there was a discussion about people that just jumped onto trendy applied topics as opposed to actually doing uh, rigorous ongoing work where they stay true to the work and actually committed to doing it longer term. And that hotness factor in terms of like the trendiness was actually generally perceived as a negative uh, mm -hmm. if people were just jumping from trendy topic to trendy topic and instead demonstrating consistency for something that maybe was trendy and has already come back down and then still is making advances with that. Uh, and then the one thing that came out around the, the publications, several mentioned that getting publications in, in the top academic journals is still critical no matter where, no, no way around that. Um, so that raises the issue of the journals themselves in terms of what can be addressed in those prestigious journals 
for actually mm -hmm. taking more of that type of work in so they can get some of the classic markers that go through the regular types of mechanisms uh, and possibly just have different types of work appear in those particular types of outlets. So that's one of the, the action levers that popped out there. Uh, and the other, uh, the last criteria that came out was actually the creative aspect in terms of demonstrating that the person actually had a creative independent voice around it as well, where they bring creative solutions to the field. And that possibly is a byproduct of it. Measurements on that are difficult though, because it basically came back to opinions of others and uh, how those opinions are evaluated around it. A lot of ambiguous measures, so not a lot of clarity. I'm sorry, off to group number four. <laughs> All right, Off to group uh, number four. Well, I, I am uh, group number four, and we also had a pretty uh, diverse group. We had someone studying blockchains, a uh, physician and psychologist, uh, someone in charge of faculty success, an electrical engineer, and me. I'm kind of an amateur sociologist, so we had a quite diverse group there. Um, and we went through sort of the standard measures that one would look for in tenure cases, publications, citations in Google Scholar, funding. There's a little ambiguity about how much patents should count. Uh, but we also had, uh, if I can call Barbara out specifically, she had some really interesting experiences in having led highly interdisciplinary projects with people in uh, really different fields, um, uh, but successfully. She said they were able to take a highly interdisciplinary project uh, and still each one managed to claim a component of it uh, to have ownership of different pieces of it, but coordinating it in such a way that they could go back to their own individual fields, publish successfully disciplinary work, uh, but also contribute to the greater whole. And the key is the ability to organize a group in a way that everyone can make contributions like that. Uh, and how do you uh, how do you evaluate work like that? It's being able to show what you have individually contributed. Yes, you're part of a highly inter disciplinary group, but you need to be able to make a clear case as a candidate. Here's the part that I can